Welcome back to the Fishing Daily podcast with me, Oliver McBride, your host. And today I'm joined by Patrick Murphy from the Irish South and West. Welcome, Patrick. Hey, Oliver. How are you? Patrick, decommissioning scheme has been uh, announced, 18 million allocated for reducing the fleet by 30 percent. What's your opinion on it? Well, when I read the minister's press release, it, it said it all, really. For any minister of any country to welcome um, a slashing or reduction of their fishing fleet um, tells the tale. Uh, I think it was the wrong language. I think the sentiment should be regrettable. We shouldn't be at this juncture. We did nothing wrong as an industry or as a country. We had 25% of the fish that we were catching taken from us. So when the department some come back and say, no, it was 15%, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, the stocks that we were hammered on or the fish that we were catching and utilizing to, to the, its fullest. In other words, we, we, we didn't even have enough of those fish for our boats to catch. Whereas we have other stocks that we don't utilize because we don't catch them uh, to their full extent. So on paper, the amount of fish we catch every year and what we lost, it was 25% you would be adding in the non-quota species. So 25% of anybody's income to be taken, unless you're going to get something back to replace that, then uh, under the law and the regulations that fishermen operate, it just wouldn't be uh, safe for them to go to sea to uh, try and target the fish that they're targeting. They wouldn't have big enough quotas under the system we have, as everybody knows. So this is why then uh, decommissioning was put on the table. But uh, it's sad that uh, anybody would welcome this. I certainly don't, and none of my members do, even some of the people who are taking this decommissioning scheme. And they're not taking it voluntarily. This money isn't enough. Because the easiest way to describe this, if anybody says, oh, it is, we have 180 boats on the register over 15 metres. And uh, I believe of fishing boats now, that is, we have other boats, but 180 fishing boats. So if 60 of them are being valued at 80 million even, and we'll, we'll top it up, it was 63, um, that's 240 million is all our fleet is worth. And sure, that doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, it just doesn't work out. So uh, it's crazy to think that that amount of money will uh, end up uh, savaging a third of our fleet. I, I, I think it's um, a sad day for our people. It's a sad day for our coastal communities and it's tragic for the future generations who just won't have an opportunity to go fishing in their own seas because uh, the opportunity just won't be there, you know, and um, nobody should welcome that. It's a poor choice of language at the very least. As you're saying, like 80 million doesn't seem to be a lot for buying out whatever 60 fishing vessels. Are the owners getting value for their money? Have to take the scheme? No, they're not, and they know they're not. And sure, we put that into the task force, and that's in the task force, Oliver. It's acknowledged that we put forward um, paperwork, and they just said they wanted value for money and for the scheme to go ahead. Uh, the, this is what they were offering. Uh, it's three thousand six hundred euros per GT, and then how much fish you catch afterwards. And we're only hearing rumours of how this is being worked out, even though we're on the task force. Um, it's saying that it's going along with the recommendations, but the recommendations were based on old um, scrappage schemes. And we in the South and West disagreed with that. We said, no, 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 that's not the way to do this. And just to give an example, Oliver, so say you have a, a two reference years or three or four reference years where a vessel or an owner through tragic circumstances or bad luck didn't catch as much fish as they normally would or could have. And yet now we're going to see that that's going to be the valuation of uh, how much money they're going to get to leave the industry. We don't operate a system like that. We operate in a pool system where everybody gets a, an equal opportunity to catch the fish that are allocated every month. And that's the way it should be worked upon. It doesn't matter what you've caught. That should be the baseline. And that baseline is 3,600 per GT at the start. So. If you were fishing in prawns or any other of the devastated uh, stocks that, that were hammered on by the TCA agreement, then of course you should be getting a premium for that. But everybody should. And age of vessels, as far as I'm concerned, shouldn't come into it either. Um, this is If this is freely and voluntarily, it should be high enough that people have a, a real true choice of taking it. 
But I don't think that's going to be the case. I think this is a value for money scheme and we're going to see a lot of boats being pu pushed out of the industry that have no choice, that um, just just can't continue um, for one reason or another. And um, and then they're going to be savaged and taken advantage of. And that's my view. And uh, let's see how this plays out. But uh, I'd say I'm fairly confident uh, that this is the tragedy that we're facing. And you've spoken before about this is not alone losing fishing boats. You're losing employment. It's damaging communities. You know, there's a, a longer chain of events that will happen from this. How do yeah. you think? How do you think coastal communities will be looking in, say, like ten years' time when when these valuable money makers are are gone? Well, communities will shut down. We've seen it already around the coastline. Um, th there's just nothing else there, like. So the, the the only thing that you might see is during the summer you'll see extra ribs or yachts or, or, or pleasure craft that'll turn up into areas like this. And, um, you know, we're, we're told that there's a heap of money there. And again, from the task force for coastal communities, for diversifying and putting people into other areas. Well, the only thing I've seen that's really available to fishermen is, um, is if you want to go glamping or buy another coffee shed or stick it on a pier and you know, um, I, I find that absolutely crazy. Um, are we going to have that around the place where fishermen have to go into that tourism industry? And yet, what's going to bring them to the area? There won't be fishing. And that is a huge tourism draw, like the people come down and see fishing boats. We know that from Castleton Bear, the amount of people that come down and join the festivals and things like that. So, you know, I, I think we're going to suffer for this, but not just in this generation, for every generation, as I said, Oliver, once these boats are gone, they're gone. We, we're not going to see anybody coming into the industry because they can't. Uh, I, I said this earlier on the interview. You just can't. Like the, the minimum that should have happened here is that we should have put a case to Europe and said, you know, this tonnage should be set aside. This tonnage should be at, at least a portion of it for future generations in case that uh, things change. No, the only way they can change is if we leave Brexit and then we see what happens um, in the UK where they're building their fleet now again because they got the fish back, the 25% the, the that we gave them um, and others, it seems to have them, as much as they complain, their fleet is being modernised and new boats are being bought all around the coastline um, from this windfall that they've got. So, you know, um, that's the only way that you're going to see it happen. So it's, this is future devastation in coastal communities. There's nothing sure because we've seen it already. And, and 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 that's it. Like you can pick pockets around the country where there's a, a few boats just left fishing. And when they're gone, who's going to replace them? They're not going to have. You're not going to have boats leaving bigger harbors to go into smaller harbors if the ones in the smaller harbors leave. Of course not. The reason why they're in the bigger harbors is because they have to have the service industry, the mechanics, and uh, the backup team that are needed there, and the engineers to get them back fishing as soon as possible. That won't happen in the small piers. Like once these boats go, so will all the engineering and everything else will go with it. And I'm guessing a lot of your members are looking at the fact that there'll be no room for modernization if you don't have enough quotas to support the industry the way it is. It's very hard to get banks or anybody to reinvest in, in, in an industry that's on its backside. You know, you're just after touching now and scratching what I think is going to be the future problem, Oliver, and, and this is where um, my fears lie. We're going to now have a department and officials and Europe will say, well, you're after losing a third of your fleet. You should have no problems now anymore of being compliant and uh, the control measures. We, you should, you'll see a big drive now for um, um, electronic monitoring you know, full electronic monitoring, so cameras and everything going into the boats. I think there will be a big, huge driver for that. And uh, I know, and you know, that uh, the the industry didn't have enough fish as it was. They suffered from COVID. Prices weren't good. Prices of fuel are going up. So we're already in crisis. So reducing the fleet by a third, I'd say, will just slightly balance the books. I don't think it's going to be enough, to be honest with you. And um, I think we're going to be hammered for that. So the next problem I see is that how much more uh, decommissioning will we see? If this is the cure, if we don't go and get more fish and the cure seems to be just a slash and burn, then I think there will be a, a, a need to slash and burn again um, within the industry. And as you said, if you don't and there isn't enough spare fish there for people to reinvest in their boats 
or build new boards, then how can they? Um, you know, and as you said, sure, it, the bank should be throwing money at us. We have the richest resource around our coastline. Uh, you know, as I said, other countries are investing in foreign fleets to fish in our waters. And and we can't have the same here. And sure, that tells the tale in itself. You know, they know that there's a good industry there, but for their fishermen to come to our waters to catch our fish, to take it back to their country. And look, regardless of what anybody says is that it's a shared resource, of course it is. Regardless of whether somebody says that we've signed up to a right that people can come into our waters to catch fish. But Brexit has proved without a shadow of a doubt that fish in your waters are yours. They would not have given the amount of fish back to the UK when they left if they didn't agree to that. They wouldn't have been able to agree to that. So these are our fish in our waters and we have a bigger claim to them than anybody else if we weren't in the EU. And tragically, that doesn't apply to us. So to answer your question, I don't think we've seen the end of this tragedy, but by God, we will do everything in our power to make sure that after this happens, that it's nearly written in stone, that it doesn't happen again, that other methods have to be found by Europe and our government, and that is giving us fish that are not caught by other countries back to the host country that need them the most. Well, it's, it's difficult to see the government doing anything because when you have a statement from the Minister for the Marine welcoming decommissioning of the fleet and then standing up and then saying in the middle of a fuel crisis saying, oh, we're not going to give any subsidy to our fleet. And yet now Spanish boats and French boats are coming into our waters and they're going to get uh, a derogation on on their fuel costs. Surely like this, this idea of a level playing field that they're talking about is, isn't happening. Well, you see, this is why, what I believe, and uh, I could be called out for this, and I've had interviews in radio stations where actually as a CEO, I should be fired. And that's the truth, um, because I'm not going to be currying favour with the department or the minister, because I, I call it as I see it, and I call it as it is, it is. And that's my own personal opinion. But uh, unfortunately for those people, I run my opinion past my board of directors so that I don't get fired. Um, and I tell them what I'm going to say, and I say, look, this is what I want to say. This is what I think we should be saying. And uh, do you agree? And they do. And that's why I'm able to say what I say and, and keep my job. Um, but I call it as I see it. And, and I think uh, the fuel subsidy is 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 crazy. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, and we've pointed this out to the minister that it isn't a level playing pitch. You cannot have two fleets fishing in the same waters, one of them getting uh, fuel at uh, 35 cent cheaper than the boat alongside them. It's bad enough that they've more fish. It's bad enough they're going back to their home markets that they have an advantage to sell their own fish to their own people. Unfortunately, we, we, we don't have the population for that. But now you have a crazy scenario where the European Commission to level the playing pitch to keep our boats fishing at sea, right, instruct us to, to, to implement these measures and our minister is still assessing the situation. Now, I called the minister um, out, let's say, on, on what I believed he believed, which was that we were telling lies. And I said, whoever's saying that, say it now. And and he said, um, you know, that he didn't believe that uh, we were saying that or that we, it was a waste of time. I also mentioned like this, this is a waste of time having meetings like this if nothing comes out of it. Um, and here we are um, months on and nothing happening and the money still sitting in the account and the minister not releasing the funds. Now, Oliver, I don't know why that is, but I believe that will bear out in the next six months. And I'll tell you why, because surely be to God, the minister must have something else earmarked for this money. Otherwise, he has to give it back. Now, any minister, any of any government, of any country, not to utilize the resources himself that are there for him to deal with a crisis. That's every other country is doing. Then assessing it isn't good enough, to be honest. Um, and I'd say a lot of boats and our members are digging holes for themselves under the um, hope 
that this will be implemented and that this money can pay off some of the few bills that they're accruing into the holes that they're digging for themselves. I genuinely believe that because I know fellas are going out, they're fishing and they're just not making money and they're taking money from their own pockets to subsidise crews, to try and keep the crews on the boats, to stay fishing, otherwise it's game over. Um, and they're fishing themselves into, into bother like. And, you know, we need a minister that's going to step up here and say, well, hang on a second, we're going to use Article 26 and point two that uh, allows us to give this money and it even has guidelines on how to do so and backdate it to the war and at a certain percentage. For us, we're talking about it wouldn't be 35 cent. We were saying that uh, on the 30 percent of the rising of the fuel cost, it might be around 20 cent or lower per litre, but backdated to when the, the war started like you're allowed. And uh, this is all we're asking for the minister. And look, if the five and a half million isn't enough, then let's talk about it after the five and a half is given out. And not just to our industry. You know, there's there's the aquaculture industry, there's the inshore fishermen, there's the um, producers that are sending this stuff and, and fuel costs, both in the factories and both in the lorries. So it's not just us that are asking for this. Uh, it's everybody. And as I said, aquaculture as well, if I missed it out, this is the same for them. They have vessels and service vessels and tractors up and down the beaches and everything else. And, Everybody's been hit by this, and this isn't of their doing. So the European Union acknowledged this. This was their doing. They decided to cut off the fuel from Russia. That was their decision. That drove the fuel prices up, you know, and uh, they decided to put in measures to help people who are primary f uh, food producers to allow them to stay in business because food security is at risk. That's what it's about. It's not about putting money in people's pockets. So you're dead right. Um, we 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 need action on 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 this, and it doesn't give you much faith um, that this is going to happen when 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 we see nothing happening. When the question was put to the Tisha Michael Martin and and the Dial, he he more or less said, "Oh, the decommissioning option is there. If you're not happy and you're not making money, there's decommissioning there." That's that's what now what I read from his remarks when when it was when the question was asked and that. Does there seem to be a control from the top over the minister rather than the minister being able to make the decisions in the best interest of the fishing industry? Yeah, but I see, I wouldn't say this is about fishing industry. I think that's policy from government. I don't think this is about one sector or one individual or, or one industry or, or I think this is this is the way we're being governed at the moment. And I think it's 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 austerity by other means. So it's a case of, well, we'll cut the cloth to measure right across the board. And I think other people are going to realise this. I think right across the public sector, they're going to realise this. You know, we don't have the money for your pay wages or your rise in thing to match inflation. So, you know, just suck it up. Um, you know, if we don't have housing for our children, like uh, suck it up. You know, it's 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 that kind of mentality. I I think that it, the ideology behind government at the moment, and as you said, this is from our Taoiseach, like, so it's OK to slash and burn um, industry and people jobs because, well, at the moment, you know, there's full employment. You can go away, you can take it if you want to, like, you know, you can suffer on. But there's no choice here. With penalty points um, and the implications of penalty points, you uh, are either stopped fishing, you can't go there. And if you uh, you devalue your asset, you de devalue your own uh, qualifications. And if you hit a magic number of points, um, you're gone and, and there's no recourse to come back in. You lose the license of the boat. You can't get it. So your boat is worthless. You have a, a fishing vessel you can't sell on. There's no license on the fishing vessel, right? I, 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 it, it's absolutely ludicrous. And somebody that's gone to college or spent their lifetime fishing. Um, and just to give an example of that, we have um, a member who is going to challenge the penalty points um, that he got because he didn't fill in the logbook in a, in a particular day. He didn't cheat, he didn't miss log fish, he didn't. So the serious infringement was a matter of timing of making an entry on the electronic logbook because there was no crime committed bar that. And when you see penalty points being given for stuff like that, then why would anybody stay in an industry when they know they don't have enough fish that if they go out in a sea of plenty and catch the wrong number of fish and come into port, they're criminalised for it. 
you know, if they declare it and they come in, then it destroys them for the following weeks and whatever else and goes into the lending obligation. And we've given presentations to Europe to say that this is why the lending obligation doesn't work for our members, because there's no leeway here. We're not the same as other countries. We're down to maybe 50 or 100 kilos of fish in a calendar month. And if you catch more than those fish, the system that we've brought in under quota balancing means that you don't get to go fishing. You know, and, and we've pointed this out in the Irish South and West, and, and this is what the realities lie for our fishermen. So for a, a, a Taoiseach to make remarks like that without being fully um, comprehensively informed of what he is saying, you know, is indicative of what's happening to us in this country. And look, I've been watching politics all my life, and I find what that Taoiseach has said in another uh, decade would have meant he would have to resign. That's the simple fact of it. But at the moment, because of the distractions that are going on and distractions in COVID, these statements are left go unanswered. And, uh, you know, only for the likes of you and, and others that give us a platform to speak about this, nobody would be speaking about it. We had a, a crazy scenario, Oliver, where our own government and, and houses of the Oireachtas were looking to buy fish from all corners of the planet rather than outside their own doorstep. And at the same time, they're passing laws to annihilate um, industries in our own country because of carbon footprint. When uh, our country produces, according to the European Eurostat, 0.09% of, of carbon for the world, right? So this makes no sense, the policies that are being followed here. And the only thing that they're getting, why they're getting away with this is because I believe our industry has been demonized, purposely so, and that fishermen are deemed to be the bad guy. And I seen a, a, a caption or, or a cartoon or you had a cow in a field, green acre field, right, eating grass. And then you had pollution in a city with cars and then uh, massive chimneys coming out of factories. And it pointed to the cow as being the one that was creating the problem of destroying the planet from cap through carbon, <laughs> rising carbon. I think it's the same for fishermen, a fisherman who risks all to go to sea. So anybody that's listening to this understands if they have anything to do with the sea, like me, when my son goes to sea, my heart is in my mouth until that young fella steps on terra firma again. And you just know the risks and the dangers that are there. But what can you do? It's part of the, the job and you have to do it. I did it myself. And you switch that part off in your brain when you're going to sea. You don't see the dangers, otherwise you can't go there. But for the person ashore, those dangers are real. You know, and for any industry to be vilified in the manner that has been vilified just because these men and women go to sea to do what they're trained to do, to do what they're asked to do as an essential industry, which is catch fish and bring them ashore. And I keep saying this, Oliver, if we are doing so much wrong, why are our boats steaming away from other fleets where they're sitting on top of fish and they're steaming away 100 or 80 miles? They're not doing it to catch more fish. They're doing it to avoid the fish that they're catching too much of to try and stay legal and come ashore. And yet these people are being vilified for doing so. And I think that's an absolute disgrace that in this age, in this century and these decades, that people who are doing their job well are being crucified for doing so. And no matter what they do and what they implement or what technical measures they bring in, and every time they're of asking, they do it. They're asked to do it. They might even lose money over doing it, but they do it just for the right to stay going fishing. And yet they're vilified. And the good things that have come out of the task force, very good things, is proper documented information. And one of the times that we were in the task force, one of the NGOs asked for, um, and rightly so, that we should be highlighting the stocks that are in trouble, you know, and the person from the Marine Institute said, well, that could be complicated. And I heard that those words and I said, well, how is that complicated? That should be easy enough. And then when I followed up on the question, I said, well, why would it be complicated? Well, there isn't really that many stocks in jeopardy in Ireland. Like there's only three out of the 72. Now, that is some achievement by our fishermen to stay under fishing in 69 of 72 stocks, and yet they're being accused of overfishing. Now, that is absolutely ridiculous. When you know that the three stocks that are there, it is not down to fishing effort, 
that is the cause of the collapse of those stocks. It's down to environmental factors. And that's a fact, you know, and and, and that's it. And at the same, and so fishermen stop fishing. We do science. We only fish scientifically, just like the Celtic Sea or the 6A herring. You know, we, we take the hits. Fellas go out with the risk of not even making money, but to get the science that there's just enough quota there to maybe cover the costs. And and yet we are being vilified for doing our job. I, I find it incredible. I keep saying that word, and I think the people out there now see what's happening to our colleagues in the farming community and are starting to realise, hold on a second here now, this doesn't make sense, and are starting to look at fishing, hopefully with open eyes and open ears and listening to what we're saying to show that the evidence is there. No, these people are really doing their best and they're just trying to make a living, support their coastal communities, and the rep rap that they are getting is just not um, justified. When you look at other nations, like uh, an Iceland and Spain and that, like in Iceland, they have actually a National Fisherman's Day where they celebrate the industry. Do you think there's something missing when, when a country that's based or see all around it doesn't celebrate what could be the biggest, the most supportive sporting industry in, in, in the country? One of the, my mother is from Hort, right? And uh, a family from Hort. And my father went fishing from Southwest Coast in, in Dublin. And one of my fondest memories as a kid growing up was going up for the blessing of the boats. I thought it was amazing, you know? And the work that fishermen did and the pride that they had in their boats. To, to get them ready and the buntings and, and the paintings of the boats and everything else. There's only one Dublin, one Hort man left who was actually originally from Cork, left fishing out of Hort. The rest are visiting boats from Gaharaid and places like that. And those traditions um, have been eroded over time, but they're not eroded because people have lost interest in it. They're eroded because the people themselves in the industry have been eroded. And the job that's there now, Oliver, has become so intense, they don't have time to put their own personal effort into those traditions and the heritage that we have, and we're losing it. So we, when I started fishing first, you had day trippers and a lot of day trippers that would be out and catch their land or catch in the evening. It's too costly to run that exercise now because of the fuel to fish, to the even just to steam out to the fishing grounds and steam back in. Um, so you have to stay out there for longer. So you have less steaming around once you get onto the fishing grounds and then that makes the trip viable. You know, this is why it's crazy why we don't have a fuel subsidy. But you're right when you say that other countries seem to treasure and, and look after their fishermen. Like we had uh, uh, seen in, in Tara Vieca where they carry the Virgin Mary around in the boats and bless the boats for the year, you know. And, and float reeds around the harbour and the amount of tourism that that generates for those few days is just an arm, enormous, right? And we could have the same at home. But as I said, I believe that our industry has purposely been vilified as the bad guys, you know, and then it's easier to target you when you have a bad reputation. And I, I feel that the only way that we're going to stop that is that we look for an indigenous status for our industry, for the customs, and, and the language we use, which is different to other people, because if you stood between two fishermen and they started talking about fishing, it is like a foreign language. It doesn't matter what you can speak or how many languages you have, unless you're one of those people, you will not keep up with the conversation. You know, the songs we have, the different um, superstitions we have and fishogs that we have in our industry are unique to us and uh, we're losing it. It's not being spoken anymore, just like you said in other countries. And we don't treasure our industry, but I think that's by um, design rather than default. I think that is that that's something that has been orchestrated because we'd be too powerful if we looked after and if the people knew how valuable the industry is and how important it is to our heritage. If, if we had a good standing in that and we had those traditions, we don't see that money being put into those to develop the industry to create a good name. And I've been saying that not just here, but in Europe, that we need to tell people about our industry, where the food comes from, how it's done. We see the the, the, the deadliest catch and the following that that has, uh, you know, well, it's no different for the deadliest catch in our waters. Maybe people are afraid that if they put it up there, that they'll find it harder to get people into the industry. I have a different view of that. I, I think it's um, 
our industry is a calling. I think it's either in here or it isn't. Very few from outside the industry come into it, and there's enough people in the coast community still alive and still there at the moment and populated to go into the industry. But they won't unless the reward meets the sacrifices that they make and what they put into it. Like, it's just not worth it. You know, you need to have a uh, life balance as well, too. And that's being lost to the industry of boats going out for two and three weeks. Like, you know, so it's very hard to keep somebody in that industry when they're missing birthdays and parties and family occasions. And, you know, some people even miss weddings because they, they have to go fishing like. And, um, you know, your your life is, is, is put on hold uh, for while you're out there. Um, but life itself isn't on hold. It continues. So when you come back in, you've missed it. It's gone by you, you know. Um, and all these things, I think, are contributing to, to the decline of our industry. And there's nothing being done about it. Um, and it's sad to see. Well, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us again. And we'll have a catch up uh, maybe next month and find out what's happening with you. Yeah, well, I'll have a look again. Um, I don't want to keep ending on a sad note, and it, it, it's it's bad that that's the case. But we have a very resilient people like that. Given half a chance, they'd stick at it. Um, and I, I believe that, and I believe that things will change. I, I, I don't believe that this is going to continue. And after this decommission, the only thing I'll say is this, is that I will be putting a lot of effort into making sure that there will be something written that this is the final one. From Europe, we'll be putting pressure on MEPs and uh, and our own politicians at home and the government that this is it. If you're accepting this, we're going to welcome no more. Something else will have to be done. So this is the line in the sand that I hope me and my colleagues and everybody else in the industry will draw and say this is it. Whatever comes out of this decommissioning, that's the last one. There has to be other solutions to this. And what we've been talking about will be implemented. That we will be looking for an indigenous status for our industry for protection all this work will be underdone and carried out by us and regardless of how busy we are we will be doing that and i can assure you that uh, we will be leading the charge in that and you'll be hearing more about it very very shortly well thank you patrick thanks oliver thanks again bye everybody